Welcome to the next installment of the Miami Group Sierra Club Virtual Backpack Series. So welcome again to uh, next edition of our Miami Group webinars. So tonight we're gonna take a little detour from our uh, backpacking series topics uh, to look at another great outdoor uh, adventure activity uh, that can still use some of the skills and some of the gear that you've acquired from your backpacking. And so we're gonna be talking about uh, an introduction to canoe and kayak uh, camping. Uh, we have to be realistic. We only have an hour here and it is virtual. So we can't teach you paddling skills and we can't teach you orienteering. Uh, but what we're hoping to do is just give you a flavor for what some of these experiences are like, the type of gear that you're gonna need, the kind of boats you, uh, would probably be using for different kinds of trips, uh, some of the skills that you should probably start thinking about developing. Uh, so if you're new to this, we really hope that you come out of it excited about the prospect of learning more and getting in, involved in one of these trips. Uh, if you are uh, experienced, if you've done this before and you know something about it, uh, we really encourage you to jump in to the conversation. So if you have a different perspective or you have a helpful tip or you just have a uh, something you've experienced, throw it in the chat box and uh, share it with the group. Okay. So uh, first off, let's introduce the uh, presenters. Uh, Amelia, you wanna start us off? And Amelia is muted as well. Hi, I'm Amelia Mengen and I spent my high school years going out and canoe camping for weeks or even two weeks at a time up in the Canadian wilderness. And I'm so very fortunate to be able to do that again with um, these great members of the Sierra Club. Okay, and Jay, can you introduce yourself? What happened to Jay? He's also Jay, Jay needs to unmute himself also. Yeah. <laughs> You're on mute, Jay. Is that better? That's yeah. much better. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Jay Freeman. I've uh, been had a lifelong association with Sierra Club through my parents before me and have been canoe camping since I was about uh, 10 or 11. Um, been all over the country and into Canada, and it really is one of the uh, the more enjoyable uh, things that I do. Welcome. Okay, thanks, Jay. And I'm Barry Randall. I uh, am the outings chair for the uh, Sierra Club Miami group, and um, I've been uh, doing these kind of paddling trips, uh, I want to say maybe 15, 20 years. Um, Started out with my daughter and Girl Scouts and then a lot of it was uh, my Sierra Club friends as well. Um, so welcome everyone, glad you could join us. So uh, just quickly, you know, when we talk about canoe and kayak, kayak camping, uh, it's really, the way I think about it is uh, if you're a, a water lover, it's, it's kind of your equivalent to backpacking. You know, you're self-sufficient, you're out there. Uh, with a lot of physical mental challenge, um, exploring. Uh, so you're carrying everything you need. So in my mind, it's very analogous to uh, backpacking, but some, some significant differences, obviously. And tonight we're gonna talk, um, well, there's a couple of different kinds of trips. Um, one is uh, an outfitter trip where they pretty much plan and execute the whole thing for you. You just show up with your personal gear and they've, pretty much provided everything else. Um, the other kind is where you're actively planning the trip yourself. Uh, you know, you may be getting some gear, some guidance from an outfitter, so you may get your canoes or some specialized gear from them, but you know, you're handling a lot of the trip yourself. And um, those are the kind of trips that we do. So that's pretty much gonna be more the focus of this presentation. And we're gonna start off with a poll, just, uh, few questions to see if uh, maybe this is something that you should be interested in trying. So Denise, can you launch that poll? I did. Oh, 
don't be shy in uh, completing the poll. Yep. And I can't see it, Denise, so you'll have to give me a heads up on what it looks like we're. We're about halfway there. Okay. That's 71 people, is that right? Uh, yep. 70, yeah. Wow. We should have it in. While we're waiting, <laughs> uh, I do want to give a shout out to uh, the folks who are helping us moderate this tonight. That's Nancy and Denise. So Hi, thank everybody. you guys for. Can we shout now? Or shout <laughs> now. Okay. Okay. We got about eighty-eight percent, so I'll go ahead and uh, share it. Share the results. Can you see the results, Barry? I can't. So if you okay. just want to run you through have, it, uh, I love the outdoors and uh, I love seeing wildlife are the high ones. Um, okay. Followed by I have or want to learn paddling skills at eighty-eight percent, and then I can use a map or compass. Sixty-four percent. I'm not intimidated by a true wilderness experience, 77%. And I like a physical and mental challenge, 78%. So okay. you got the high ratings of 98 and 95, even for I love the outdoors and love seeing wildlife. So. Okay, great. Yeah, and that, uh, don't be misled by the intimidation uh, question there, because, uh, you know, just like other trips, these come in all levels of challenge and difficulty. So, um, uh, I'm sure there's a trip out there that's going to fit you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to close that out and Nancy flip to the next slide. Okay, so there, there's a huge variety of different kinds of paddle trips. Um, you know, it can be everything from a very placid paddle across a very calm lake or reservoir or something to, uh, you know, running rapids to uh, being out on open water and fighting big waves and wind. Uh, but for us, it, it all kind of distills down into these three categories, river trips, uh, trips that are on lake systems, and a shoreline or a big water kind of trip. And the reason we break them out this way is that the skills that you may need, uh, the gear that you may want to bring, and the type of boat that you may want to use is going to vary a bit depending on which uh, category your, your trip falls into. They're all great trips, uh, but we're going to go through them uh, one by one here. So let's start with uh, river trips. I mean, river trips are obviously on a river, so it's, uh, it's moving water. Um, depending on the river, obviously, it may include rapids. Um, anytime you're on moving water, your paddling skills um, need to be a little bit higher than uh, paddling on, on still water. So that's something to consider. But, you know, you certainly have to uh, know the, the river that you're gonna go on and uh, what kind of rapids, if any, they're gonna be, be on there. Um, you know, most of the trips that we've been on and most of the rivers that you'll hear referenced here don't have, uh, don't have anything beyond maybe a class one or two uh, kind of rapid on it. Um, Allagash is a good example. There's a beautiful mile-long section on the Allagash that's, uh, that's rapids, that's, but it's probably only class two. Um, the other thing about river trips is the water levels are potentially going to vary dramatically uh, and sometimes quite quickly. Uh, now, it all depends on, on what the water source is for that river. If it's a spring-fed river, it, it may be pretty constant year-round. If it's fed mainly through uh, rainwater, it can change dramatically. Uh, we've done a number of trips uh, down at Big South Fork, uh, if you're familiar with that. And that the river level there changes uh, dramatically. You, one week you can be literally dragging over gravel and the next week uh, you're on a roaring rapids. So just check ahead of time and see which kind of river it is and whether you need to be aware of the, uh, the level. Usually there's pretty limited portaging. Uh, it might be some around some shallows or, or some rapids, um, but usually not a lot on these, on these trips, which means you can go a little heavier as far as your gear and your food, your boat can be a little bit heavier. 
Uh, you're not constantly getting in and out of the boat like you will on some of the trips we'll talk about later. Um, navigation, obviously, is uh, relatively straightforward. You're following a river. So it's kind of like, you know, following a well-marked uh, backpacking trail. Um, mainly, again, like a trail, the, the challenge is to figure out how far along you are. Uh, so you do still have to keep an eye out for, for landmarks and that sort of thing. But other than that, you know, navigation is generally not an issue. Canoes or kayaks are appropriate. Um, you know, type of canoe can be pretty much anything. Uh, I've done that big South Fork trip, for example, with my uh, Royal X canoe, which is a heavy bastard. It probably weighs 80, 85 pounds. Um, but that's fine because you only have like one or two portages and it's not a big deal. Um, a kayak, you can certainly do it. Uh, obviously, you're not going to use a long boat, a sea kayak or something like that. And you probably don't want to use a play boat either because you're going to be taking gear. So, you know, a moderate size touring kind of kayak is, is perfect for these trips as well. And the Buffalo Current, Allagash, Tuolumne, Green, those are all good examples of river trips that, uh, that we would recommend. Okay. Okay, lake systems. So this is the next category. This is my personal favorite uh, category. Uh, I just love these kinds of trips uh, because of the diversity that you see. You got small lakes, you got big lakes, you got streams and rivers connecting those lakes. Uh, you have uh, marshy areas with, you know, cattails and uh, lily pads, and then you have, you know, granite rock faces, you know, plunging into into the lake. So, uh, just I love the diversity of these kind of kind of trips personally. Uh, it's primarily flat water paddling, obviously, although there are streams and rivers that can connect them. Um, don't typically see a lot of rapids, although there's a trip that we do up in Quetico that's um, called the Falls Chain, and it, it probably has some class two rapids in there between some of the lakes, but generally you're not going to see a lot of rapids. Um, usually it involves portaging between these lakes. Um, now you can plan a trip in these kinds of systems and, and minimize or have no portaging. Right, you can do that, but typically, if you're going to actually get out into the true backcountry, you're going to find yourself doing some portaging, and in some trips, you're going to do some significant portaging. Uh, we've done trips where we've done six, seven, eight portages a day. Um, I'm sure we had days where there were more than that. So that that's going to drive some decisions about the type of boat and some of the gear, and we'll talk more about portaging. Uh, it's more challenging navigation, too. Uh, you know, you're down close to the water. These can be fairly complex uh, lake systems uh, with a lot of little bays and peninsulas and things. So knowing how to use a uh, map and compass, having a map uh, is pretty critical in these areas. Uh, most paddlers are going to opt for canoes. Um, it's not to say that you never see people in kayaks out in these uh, areas, but most people go for a, a canoe. Uh, because of the portaging. And uh, canoes are just easier, frankly, for most people to carry on a portage. They're easier to get in and out of. They're easier to get your gear in and out of. So that constant unloading, carrying, reloading just works better for most people with a, with a canoe and preferably a lightweight canoe like a Kevlar. Um, you can, a 17 foot Kevlar canoe is gonna weigh maybe 40 pounds versus that 80 pound monster Royal X that I mentioned before for a river trip. So some of the, um, some of the areas that you know, we've been to or, or know about that would fit this are Boundary Waters up in Minnesota, Quetico, which is the Canadian version of Boundary Waters, which is the other side of the border. Uh, Algonquin Provincial Park are all good examples of this, okay? And the last category is, uh, what I call shoreline or big water. So um, now some of the river system trips, you can find some big water. Uh, there's some big lakes up in say Boundary Water or Quetico. So this isn't solely, uh, you know, bays and things like that uh, or the Great Lakes. Um, so they, they, they can't overlap, uh, but it's basically flat water paddling again 
Uh, the difference being is that you may find some really challenging big waves and wind and, uh, you know, weather systems coming up quickly uh, can be uh, more of a challenge and more of a threat if you're on a big open lake uh, like this. Um, generally, little or no portaging uh, because you're usually just bouncing around between, uh, between islands or campsites along the shore. Uh, so there's rarely portaging on these kinds of trips. Um, navigation though can again be somewhat challenging. You're down close to the water, you're looking out across a wide expanse um, into the distance, and it can be difficult to make out the features of a, of a shoreline. If there's lots of little islands, it can be pretty confusing to figure out which one is which on your map. So being able to, uh, you know, take a bearing, stay on a heading, uh, those are some skills that, that you really are going to need. Um, and uh, Sea kayaks or canoes are, are perfectly fine. The kayaks work well, uh, like the one pictures here, a friend of ours, I think that's Sandy in that picture, uh, in her sea kayak. Uh, these work well for these kinds of trips because you're not constantly unloading or reloading them. You know, it's pretty much you load them up in the morning and unload it at the end of the day. So they, they work pretty well. Georgian Bay, Apostle Islands, Voyagers National uh, Park are all good examples of, of these kinds of trips, okay? All right, I won't go through all these, but you know, these are just some of the trips that uh, we've gone on that uh, we really enjoyed. And uh, if you have specific questions about these, we can probably answer them. Boundary Waters I talked about, um, again, one of my favorite bucket list trips. You know, if it's not on your bucket list and you're at all interested in this stuff, it should be. I've probably been there. 10 times. Uh, Quetico, uh, basically the, the Canadian version of that. Uh, Buffalo River, beautiful. Um, that was uh, one of the pictures in uh, the slide on the river systems there was Buffalo. It's got those beautiful bluffs. Uh, very nice. Current River, it's a very nice one through the Ozarks. Allagash, uh, it's a great trip for uh, wildlife, moose, uh, that sort of thing. Um, Georgian Bay, that was one of our big water trips. Uh, and uh, Spanish River up in Ontario, that's another, another great trip. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, a few that are still kind of on our, on our bucket list, although um, Jay has done a couple of these. So Jay, I think did Okie Finoki and Green, if I'm not mistaken. So if you have questions about those, Jay can probably answer, answer that. Uh, Tuolumne, uh, no attack. Nani, uh, all have great reputations, can't speak to them. Uh, I'm personally intrigued by the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, 740 miles that you know spans 23 rivers and 59 lakes. That just, to me, that's kind of like the AT of the paddling world. So uh, maybe someday, we'll see. Okay. Um, Throw in a couple of slides here, just, you know, I was thinking about what distinguishes really a paddling trip from some of the other activities we've talked about, like backpacking or even a bicycle touring trip. And, you know, while you certainly see wildlife on, say, a backpacking trip, you see it in spades on a paddling trip. I mean, it's just, it seems like it's just 10 times, you know, order of magnitude, more different kinds of wildlife you see on a paddling trip. Uh, both waterfowl, amphibians, you know, things like moose, otters, beavers, uh, eagles, you know, you just, it's just, seems to me that that's one of the distinguishing differences that really, to me, makes a paddling trip uh, just well worth it. Uh, and the other, the other difference is, um, you know, the connection that many of these areas have to indigenous peoples or, you know, uh, Native American history. And Sierra Club, you know, tries to respect the whole land ownership concept. And uh, these pictures are actually all from Boundary Waters, so the petroglyphs up there. And it's kind of cool to paddle past something that was probably painted by someone in a canoe five or 600 years ago. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing. But all of these waterways really if you think about it, they were used by Native Americans long before anybody else showed up as their trade routes and they're just the mode of transportation, right? And the fact that, you know, you're still using the same kind of boat 
that they used, you know, a thousand years ago. To me, that's all pretty cool. So that is another thing that to me kind of makes us uh, special and unique. Okay. Type of boat. So we talked a little bit as we went through this as to, you know, which trips you might want to look at a canoe and which ones you might want to look at a kayak. But, you know, in general, a canoe is, you can carry a bigger load, uh, carry heavier, heavier things. It is easier to portage. Uh, that's Amelia there. She's got that uh, Kevlar canoe up on her shoulders. I think that's Amelia. I don't know. Yes, that, that's me. That? Oh, okay. Um, and most people find it easier to portage than say a kayak. Um, most people on kayaks don't actually have the shoulder pads like that. You can do that, but most kayakers I know don't do that. They kind of hoist it up either on their shoulder or they're pulling it along like a dog on a leash. Uh, neither of which is a really great way to, to do a portage. Um, they'll, they'll typically pair it. Um, yeah, or pair it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. two people carrying yeah. two boats. Yep. And uh, easy, easy to rent um, from outfitters in these areas and, or can actually be purchased uh, pretty reasonably into the season. So if you really get into this, uh, you can buy a used boat. And I think, Jay, we figured out it was like maybe three trips you'd pay for a, a used boat. Well, you, can uh, buy a, you can buy an old uh, plastic boat from a local outfitter at the end of the year for two, three hundred dollars. And you can buy a Kevlar boat at the end of the year for about a thousand. Yeah. Yeah, and a, and a typical trip, you know, we probably spend like three or four hundred dollars um, renting uh, a canoe. So, kayaks uh, a little more limited as far as the carrying capacity, and also the um, the uh, hatches, you know, tend to be smaller. So it's, it's tough to get a, like a full-size pack, and we'll talk about gear packs in a bit here. Um, you, you have to kind of have smaller bags, and smaller bags are more of a hassle when you're doing portaging again. So that's just a consideration. Uh, but they can be more stable, you know, particularly a sea kayak and big waves, open water. Uh, they can be difficult to uh, maneuver easily if you're in swampy, brushy kinds of routes, and some of these lake systems have a have a lot of that. And as we said, a little more difficult to portage. So, okay. So Jay, you wanna talk a little bit about gear? Oh boy, oh boy. Okay. Um, that's my driveway. And I don't know if you can see numbers or not, really not all that important. Um, paddles, uh, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, for a first timer, an inexpensive aluminum shaft black plastic paddle like the one pictured on the left there is a good choice. They're inexpensive, they're very sturdy. Uh, one feature for all paddles, that's, uh, that is that they have either a wood, aluminum, or a fiberglass shaft if you're gonna buy one, or even if you're gonna rent one. Uh, stay away from those that are all plastic shafts, they tend to be very weak. Uh, and you should have at least one extra uh, on the trip. I have one extra in, in each of my canoes. Uh, you, you never know uh, when you're going to need it, and uh, it's just a good thing to have. Uh, the PFDs over on the right, the personal flotation devices, the types shown uh, fit like a jacket, and uh, they're better than those that fit over your head, which is not shown. Uh, that just has a flotation in the front. The jacket type uh, offer more protection and are very comfortable. And these really should be worn at all times when you're on the water. Uh, you know, a lot of people hesitate, but you get used to it. Uh, it, it, it you, after a while, you'll feel uncomfortable without it. And that's the way you should feel. At the top. Actually, I actually find, Jay, they, they kind of keep me warm in the morning, yeah, you know, when you're heading do. down, it's kind of chilly. Yep, that they do. Um, first aid kit, uh, you can buy that, uh, you can buy first aid kits. Uh, if you see that little blue box up or a little yellow box at the top, those are nice little boxes to have in a canoe. You can get at, into them and out of them very quickly. They're waterproof. You can get them in any outfitters. Uh, we use it to pack our own first aid kit, but you can, 
you know, you can make, you can buy one uh, pre-made. You might want to check it as soon as you get it and make sure all the alcohol wipes haven't dried out, but uh, uh, you can get as fancy as you like. Um, the uh, two things uh, to the right of the paddles are throw bags. Uh, they, uh, every canoe should have one or something like that in case somebody does go over or somebody's in trouble. Uh, uh, that's what these are for. They're meant to be thrown to somebody that's in trouble, that needs to be dragged in. They're usually 50 foot lengths of, um, of rope. And uh, what you do is you hold the one end and throw the bag out to the people. Very, very uh, useful um, items. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, you've got various little tie ropes there. They, they're just light gauge ropes. Stay away from cotton to tie bags into the canoe, tie them to thwarts, tie them to the seats, just in case you do go over, things aren't floating all over the place uh, and you can get, uh, get back to them or get them back to you. Uh, in any of the trips, whether you're on a lake or on a river, you should have something to get the water out of your boat. Some people use pumps, I use balers, and they're just a stout plastic bottle where you cut the bottom out and uh, take the top on you can get a lot of water out of your boat very quickly with something like that. Um, the roll of tape down at the bottom, that's, your, uh, that's what's going to fix your boat if you ever have, uh, have any trouble. And all it is is a roll of duct tape. Uh, you can punch a, a hole in a boat, and that'll fix it right up for you. Every uh, canoe should have bow and stern lines, whether you're on a lake or on a river. doesn't matter. It should be about uh, 15 feet long. Um, and this again should be nylon, three eighths of an inch, uh, a quarter to three eighths of an inch. Don't want them too narrow because then they'll cut into your hands if you really have to do some pulling. Okay. Next one. Oh, we are on the next one. There we go. Um, gear for camp. Um, Almost all of the uh, of what you see there is going to be necessary for uh, any river or lake trip. If you're on a trip that requires portaging, then your choices of equipment should be made considering uh, bulk and weight. But all of the things there you're going to need in one form or another. Um, you can see the difference in size of the two tents at the top. Uh, tents should be freestanding since uh, you may be on a rocky. Uh, area where you can't drive stakes well. Um, hammocks work, but then you have to have trees, and that is not a guarantee either. So uh, uh, the freestanding tents, I think, tend to be the best choice. Um, the green rollover on the right with the poles, that's a tarp. I always carry a tarp for the group. Uh, they can be set up very quickly. Uh, if it's raining, you can set them up for lunch to eat under. Uh, uh, Said we always set one up in camp when we get to camp, so we've got a dry place uh, to uh, to eat uh, or cook. And also, if you're ever on the buffalo and you need to get out of the sun, it may be the only chance you have to get out of the sun is a tarp like that because they're, they're wide open beaches and no shade. Um, sleeping gear, uh, we. Uh, there's a variety of pads there. You see three, the orange bag is a, uh, is a, a blow up. And then there's a Z pad behind it. Uh, everybody should have a Z pad. They're just the most versatile, lightest uh, piece of equipment uh, for camping. You can sit on them, you can lay on them, you can use them underneath your other pads in the tent. They're just, and they're cheap and they're light and they're just wonderful. They're also great to uh, bungee to the seat of your uh, canoe. If, yeah. Uh, if you want a little more comfortable seat. Well, yeah, because a lot of those rental canoes have really low seats and uh, get you up a little bit more. And then I use uh, down bags because they're light and they're warm. Um, you can use anything, you know, that's going to keep you warm. Uh, you just need to keep it dry. Uh, chair. Uh, on a uh, ported trip, I tend not to take a chair. Uh, or I won't take two chairs, I'll take maybe one. 
Uh, they should be lightweight and easy to use. And again, you can always use your uh, Z pad for a, uh, for a chair. Stoves, uh, you see three of them there in the upper left. Uh, the green is an old, uh, and I mean old, Coleman two burner stove that I use on a non portage trip typically. And then there's two backpack stoves there, a, uh, a uh, LP gas one and a, a, a liquid fuel one uh, that you would uh, certainly want to use when you're portaging. Pots and pans tableware, they should be nestled. Um, and, uh, you know, you, again, if you're on a portaging trip, you, you take a lot uh, fewer of them. Uh, but again, if you're not, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the backpack um, pots are down at the bottom in the, with a black bag. And then on top is more what I would use on most canoe trips with frying pans and coffee pots and all that, all that kind of a thing. What's not pictured there is uh, our water purification systems. There are many ways to do this. You can use chemicals, ultraviolet light pumps, gravity filters, but you have to have something. You do not want to drink any of this water anywhere you are, right out of the lake or river. Uh, on shorter trips, you can carry all the water you need. We've carried water for as many as uh, four, uh, many days as four days. Uh, you don't want to portage with that, but then uh, this would be a river trip. Fire starters and saw also not pictured uh, makes life a lot easier when you're trying to build a fire. Toiletries, you need something. Uh, there, if there's no outhouse available, and there are in some of these, the Boundary Waters areas have them, Spanish River has them, but most of your uh, places will not have uh, outhouses. So you have to do something, a simple shovel uh, works. Uh, you can use uh, uh, what, they, what they call wag bags, which uh, ends up, you carry these things out in a big uh, Ziploc bag. And biodegradable soap, need some of that. Okay, food and water. Um, what do I have here first? Uh, okay, this looks uh, for portage trips. Um, freeze dried meals in a bag work very well, very easy to, to get. Uh, you know, they really come a long way with this kind of a food, dried fruits and nuts. Uh, work well, they last well. Uh, you can take eggs, pre-cooked sausage and bacon. They'll be good for three or four days unless the weather's really hot. But you can keep a lot of this stuff cool if you keep it uh, at the, uh, the bottom of the boat next to the water. Uh, you know, you just don't keep it up on top where it gets uh, hot. You can take fresh, uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. I would suggest carrots, radishes, and onions. Uh, potatoes, things like that. Don't use the baby carrots, they tend to go rotten. Apples and oranges last very well. Um, pancake mixes, pancakes with maple syrup is a good way to start today. The um, they're easy to, uh, they're easy to cook and they're, it's just a wonderful way to start. Butter in a protective container will last three or four days. You know, it doesn't get too hot. You don't want to, you want to take it out of something that's, uh, and put it in a, in a, something that'll seal very well. Prepared foods like mac and cheese and spaghetti, uh, canned or dried meats, fish, tuna and salmon work well. Cheese lasts for a good bit of time. Um, Breads, uh, pita breads, tortillas, and crackers work best. Peanut butter and jelly, um, you know, is a great way to uh, to, to have uh, a great meal for lunch. Um, if it's your first trip, uh, keep it simple. You know, you, you just you just want to make sure that you're you don't go to bed hungry and you don't start the day hungry. Uh, so uh, you know, try not to get. Too crazy right off the bat. Just keep it simple. Um, that last sign, uh, with practice, uh, you'll enjoy the options uh, usually unavailable uh, uh, 
I can't even see what it says. Oh, uh, like fishing or the reflector oven you see over there on the left. But we have more fun with that, that silly little oven. Uh, everybody watching and waiting for that cake to come out. Yeah, I was going to say that, uh, you know, I don't think I ever take a reflector oven on a backpacking trip. But uh, that's the nice thing about uh, a paddling trip. You can, you can do yeah. stuff like this and get away with it. And it is a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do I have another slide? Do I have another slide or is that my this it's, slide? It's, uh, Jay, yeah, I think you continue with food and water. You're, you're there. Okay. You're non-portage trips. Right. <laughs> Go ahead and come down. All right. Uh, for non-portage trips, uh, you, you can probably take anything that you would uh, car camping. We assume that you've been car camping or you know what we're talking about. You can take anything you want. Fruits, uh, apples and small oranges, again, are best. But now, and, and the same with the vegetables, uh, uh, carrots, radishes, potatoes, onions, and cabbage do well. Uh, now we can start taking uh, milk boxes. Uh, you don't want to take anything that's got water in it on, a back, on, your, on your portaging, but now we can start taking things that are, are, are hydrated. Eggs, again, work well in a protected container. Um, meats and cheeses. Uh, it looks like I'm saying the same thing over and over, aren't I? Uh, here you can start taking uh, spices and cooking oils and things like that. When you're on a river trip, and we do this many times, you can take a cooler, and as long as you are not opening and closing that cooler all the time, you can uh, a cooler with a couple of gallon milk bottles filled with water will keep things fresh for you know four days. Uh, now it's not going to keep beer cold, but uh, you know you, you you'll have your veg your some vegetables in there, butter, things like that eggs, and they'll last you for about four days. You want to protect it from the sun. Uh, you can take prepared meals like chili and spaghetti and freeze them ahead of time, put them in the bottom of the cooler, and they'll be good for uh, two, three days. Uh, uh, I remind you that many things like fruits and vegetables don't need refrigeration, so you just only want to put something in a cooler that you really have to keep uh, cool. I think that's all I have. All right. Thanks, Jay. I think we're up to Amelia yeah. now. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about packs and food storage and basically for carrying your gear. Um, I'll talk about three different types of backpacks. The first is just a regular backpack, and these are comfortable to carry but they do get soaked with water. So um, everything inside must be put in a dry bag or in a plastic bag inside a plastic bag and closed well with a heavy duty rubber band. But again, regular backpacks are comfortable to carry. Um, a Duluth pack is that blue pack you see pictured there and Duluth packs are water resistant. Plus you can spray them with waterproofing so they do a good job of um, wicking water off if it's raining, but they still will absorb some water and they're not totally waterproof. So once again, you have to line that pack with a heavy duty garbage bag and then everything inside should be in smaller dry bags or plastic bags. The, the best of these uh, packs to use are the ones like the yellow pack, which is a dry bag pack. It's made of a very heavy duty vinyl or plastic with a top that folds over several times to really keep everything waterproofed inside. And it has backpack straps attached. So it's very nice to portage with. The, the dry bag, um, is pictured down there, that orange one, that's a typical dry bag. It's nice to have a small dry bag in your canoe to carry things that you might need during the day, like uh, sunscreen, toilet paper, maybe your lunch, a snack. You can keep that strapped to one of the canoe thwarts and it'll just be handy all day long. 
As far as food storage, it depends if you're going to be in bear country or if it's not bear country and you're just worried about critters. If you're in bear country, you can use a bear barrel like the blue one that's pictured there, a bear bear barrel, or sometimes it's called a canister, is a thick container, usually plastic, used as a physical barrier to protect your food and scented items from the bears. The bear barrels have special locks on them, which makes it very difficult or impossible for a bear to open. These work very well and they also keep food from being crushed so you can bring cookies or crackers. And yes, it's a B-E-A-R barrel, not a B-E-E-R barrel. <laughs> I saw the comment there from someone. Um, another option if you're in bear country is an ursac, which is pictured there, the black bag. An ursac is a a bag made of ultra high molecular lightweight polyethylene. The bag Ooh. closes with heavy duty Velcro and has a strong drawstring closure above the Velcro. The Ursac, and that is a, a brand name, is according to them, is the only interagency grizzly bear committee certified lightweight and collapsible alternative to bear canisters. Um, and these bags, according to the website, have gone through one full hour of continuous contact with at least one bear attempting to pull food out. And the bag came out victorious. The bear was not able to make a hole larger than one quarter inch. So on, on our, our canoe trip this past summer, we packed food for nine days. I used a small bear canister and my ursac and was able to carry um, those two items, carried all my food for nine days. Another option in bear country is a bear hang. Um, teaching how to do a bear hang is obviously beyond the scope of this presentation, but it involves throwing a rope over a branch and hanging your food bag so that the food bag is at least 12 feet above the ground, six inches from the tree trunk, and several feet below the branch or the line. You would put your food in a waterproof bag and hang it um, when you do the bear hang. And um, sometimes it's just difficult to find the right kind of tree to do a bear hang. So the bear barrels and ursacs do come in very handy. If you just have to worry about critters getting in your food, you can use a rat sack. That's also a brand name. The rat sack is a rust proof stainless steel mesh food bag that closes with a wide strip of heavy duty Velcro and can be hung from a tree. Um, they, they work very nicely also and they're not too heavy. A cooler does work for um, keeping critters out. Of course, again, a cooler wouldn't be too practical on a portage trip because uh, there's it'd be difficult to lug a, a big cooler down the trail, but for river trips, it works fine. And of course, you can always do a bear hang. Okay, clothing. We're on to clothing. You wanna think rain, sun, and bug protection. You wanna think quick drying fabric. Um, we'll use the old adage, cotton is rotten as far as um, backpacking and canoeing because cotton absorbs water. It, it's heavy when it gets wet. It, once it gets wet, it tends to stay wet. And um, you just want to pick the quick drying fabric. On our trips, we tend to have a set of clothes that we wear during the day. And then we have a set of clothes at night. So our clothes during the day will be shorts or quick drying pants. A quick drying shirt with long sleeves helps to save on sunscreen. Water shoes. Um, some people use water shoes like you buy in the store. Some people use sandals with socks. Just whatever you wear, know that they're going to get wet. Um, a brimmed hat with a strap. Barry has a nice looking hat on there in the photo. 
you need the strength the there, but, um, <laughs> so if a gust of wind comes up you don't lose your hat out in the lake um, also helps with uh, sun protection paddling gloves i think barry has his paddling gloves on in that photo some people always use them i never use them so it's just personal preference and then your uh, camp clothes in the evening just um Often we're going north on our trips and it might be a little cooler in the evening. So um, whatever you need to keep yourself warm in the evening. Um, you do, it is a good practice to treat your clothes with permethrin. I have a bottle of permethrin here. You can buy it at Walmart. And permethrin is a natural bug repellent produced by chrysanthemums, the flower. Permethrin binds to the fabric once you spray it on your clothes. Um, it binds to the fabric and eliminates the risk of overexposure to your skin. And a bottle of permethrin, like I showed you, lasts six weeks or six washings. According to the label, permethrin not only repels insects, but it actually kills ticks, mosquitoes, chiggers, mites, and more than 55 other kinds of insects on contact. So it can be very, it's very good idea to treat your clothes with permethrin, especially if you're going during um, June or July when it's bug season. Let's see, what else? Um, L.L. Bean sells a line of clothing with, a, with their brand name Insect Shield. And the Insect Shield is basically permethrin but the way they bind it to the fabric, they say that it's effective for 70 washes. So uh, might not be a bad idea to invest in some insect shield clothing if you're going into a real buggy area. You will want some camp shoes for in the evening, just something, a closed toe shoe to keep your feet dry and warm after a day of frequently being wet. And, um, and then, of course, you want to have rain gear. Again, if it's cool, a light jacket and a cap for the evening. I like wool socks all year round, even in the summer. And a swimsuit and something to sleep in. Um, can be lightweight, long underwear. Just something so that if you have to get up in the middle of the night and use the privy, um, you have something on. That's about all I have to say about clothing. Um, well, actually I do have a final note on gear. If you have limited uh, cash, three top pieces of gear we suggest you buy. The, the dry bags are, are just really handy. Like I said, it's um, much more practical than double bagging everything with plastic bags and using rubber bags. Um, a dry bag pack or a Duluth pack a personal flotation device that is comfortable and fits, and water shoes like those pictured or sandals are, are nice things to put your money out for. Okay, um, Nancy, I'm gonna suggest since we're running a little tight on time here that we skip this uh, question, stop. And uh, I noticed we got some good conversation going on in the chat. So I encourage everybody to keep answering your own questions because right? <laughs> you're doing a great job on it. And then uh, if there's any that haven't been addressed, we'll catch them at the end. Thanks. Okay, uh, quick note just on uh, camping and hygiene. Uh, campsites, uh, much like uh, backpacking, uh, is basically gonna be either designated campsites or open camping. A lot of the river trips, for example, tend to be open camping where it's just finding a, a, you know, a, a bank or a river bar or something. Uh, and a lot of places like, uh, I don't know, Boundary Waters um, and some places like Allagash, they'll have uh, designated campsites. So just know beforehand um, which type that you're, you're getting into. And uh, Jay talked a little bit about hygiene, so I won't spend a lot of time there, but Basically, you know, much like backpacking, sometimes you'll find some some form of privy. Others, it'll be true backcountry, you know, leave no trace, waste disposal. And please remember, leave no trace. 
Um, and some will, as Jay said, require a wag bag. Uh, that's pretty rare, but some trips actually uh, require you basically to pack your waist out. Okay. Uh, navigation. I touched on this a, a couple of times when we were talking about the trips, but um, this to me is another unique feature of paddling trips is that some of them do require some actual navigation skills. Usually you don't see that on backpacking unless you're doing true off trail kinds of uh, back uh, back country, uh, you know, bushwhacking. But uh, it, for trips that are on lake systems yeah. and coastal okay. areas, open water, right. um, it, okay. it, it really You're is right. uh, important. Yeah. It's all right. It's okay. <laughs> Amelia, you're not on mute. Somebody mute her. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was talking that, to my cat. That's I'm okay. Sorry. No. That's okay. We, we figured you weren't talking to us. <laughs> You're still not <laughs> muted. You anyway. got to mute yourself. Good. Um, the other uh, important aspect of navigating is uh, learning how to use the terrain to mitigate some of the wind and wave action. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you may be looking at your map and uh, you come out on the next lake and somewhere across that lake is the next portage and a straight line might in fact be the shortest path. Uh, but in fact, you may want to take a different route that, you know, takes you leeward of some of the little islands or some headlands or something to protect you from some uh, wind and wave action. Allows your, your group to kind of regroup, allows people to take a rest where that you might not be able to if you just head straight across, you know, a big lake. So uh, having those kinds of skills are important. Um, take a paper map and <laughs> take a map case. Um, you know, don't rely on an electronic device, their greatest backup, but um, uh, they tend not to behave well sometimes in water. And, you know, like with any trip, uh, the best way to avoid getting lost is to always know where you are. So just follow your path on the map at all times. And even if you're not leading the trip, really encourage people to, you know, pay attention and um, try and know where you are, even if you're not leading that trip. It's just a great way to develop these skills. Uh, and actually, I recommend that for backpacking or any kind of trip. Okay. A uh, little bit more on portaging. Again, we've, we've touched on some of this. Um, you know, these portages can be uh, just a, a few yards or a mile or more, which is probably the most that we do on our typical trips. The Grand Portage is 18.5 miles. I've never done that one, but that's the uh, old uh, French fur trader route that uh, goes into um, uh, Lake Superior. So that would be kind of cool to do. The, the portage routes themselves, they can be dirt, they can be brush, they can be rock, they can be swamp. Uh, so you can be walking through muck. Uh, it can be a boardwalk. So just be prepared that... Uh, these portages can uh, can be really anything. And that's another reason to have some good water shoes, typically with toe protection on them. Uh, Amelia talked a little bit about Duluth and dry bag packs. You know, really the best option for gear if you're doing a lot of portaging is you really don't want to have a lot of little uh, hand carry items, a lot of clutter, if you will. Um, is it's just that much more difficult to uh, make that trip across. And uh, I think she mentioned as well, the coolers are, you know, not a good idea. And we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the lightweight canoes. Uh, you can see somebody there, and I forget who that is. Maybe that's Jeff that's, flipping his, uh, his Jeff. boat into the water. Yeah. Um, so uh, well worth the, uh, the additional rental costs. Can I say something? Yeah, jump in. Uh, two, two things. Um, this navigation thing. Um, uh, don't be afraid to be lost. You, you know, if, as soon as you can admit that you really don't have no clue where you are, then the sooner you're going to get out of that situation. So, you know, there's a there's like a pride thing there or something. I don't know. But, you know, when you're lost, uh, you, you need to realize you're lost and not go willy nilly all over the place trying to get unlost. The second thing we've mentioned those Duluth packs a lot. What those are is they're, they're just a lightweight shell meant to carry a lot of little bags, sleeping bags, food bags, 
whatever. You just throw all that stuff into that one pack. That's what the Duluth bag is all about. That's all. Yeah, yeah and actually those Duluth bags, um, they're actually, the size of them actually fits a canoe really well. And I think that's yeah. honestly where they kind of came from. They just have that kind of short squat wide stance to them that fits nicely in the bottom of a canoe. Uh, okay, thanks, Jay. Um, just a little bit on planning a trip. Um, outfitters are a huge help. So wherever you're going, I, it always pays. I always talk to an outfitter, even if I don't plan to actually use them for anything. I'll ask them for a trip recommendation. I'll tell them, um, you know, I'd like to be out for 10 days and, you know, a loop trip and this kind of thing, whatever, and just get their advice. They'll usually, you know, send you a few recommended trips and, you know, uh, entry points and whatever. So it uh, can be a big help if you need a shuttle or something. They can obviously arrange that. Uh, I saw somebody in the chat was mentioning permits. Um, so that's something else to be aware of. Some of these trips do require permits. Um, just like uh, some of the big backpacking destinations. And they do often restrict you to certain dates and certain entry points. So again, just like, you know, you were planning a big trip on the John Muir Trail. Uh, if you're planning a, a trip out to Boundary Waters, uh, you want to apply early because you want to be able to get your entry point for the, the trip that, uh, that you want. Um, and if you're going to do fishing, don't forget uh, you need licenses for fishing. Um, and just like, again, a big backpacking trip, you know, there's scads of resources out there, guidebooks, online resources. So check all those out as well. Uh, and as far as, you know, preparation and skills, we've talked about paddling skills. Just make sure that your paddling skills uh, match the trip. And that's not to, you know, again, don't mean to instill fear or intimidate people. I have personally taken groups of Girl Scouts out on, you know, 10 day wilderness trips. And believe me, they did not all have excellent paddling skills. So, you know, these, these trips are very doable, um, but it's just a matter of kind of matching your skills to, to the trip. Um, navigation skills, again, you know, match that to the trip or have someone with you that has those skills that can kind of lead the trip and you, the rest of you can learn from it. Um, a spot, an inReach, a sat phone, uh, highly recommended for uh, wilderness trips. Uh, the picture to the right there uh, was from our Georgian Bay trip uh, where one of our party uh, actually broke her thigh bone. So uh, we fortunately had a sat phone. So, you know, these things happen and you're in the wilderness, and if you're three or four they days, very often. they don't happen very often. Uh, this is the only one that happened for us. So. But, uh, you know, you have to be obviously right over here something if you're going to be, if you're three or four days out in the wilderness. And we said before, you know, the first time out, just choose a simple trip, you know, do, do uh, Little Miami River or, uh, you know, uh, Caesar Creek Green, or something. Yeah. Green River and, in Kentucky. Yeah. And, uh, you know, make it a simple one and just kind of shake down your gear and all that. Uh, we're going to post this, but, you know, these are some links to some resources that are some, you know, introductory kind of overviews of some of the topics we've talked about. Uh, some of the best trips in the country, some details there, uh, a complete gear list. You know, Jay hit the high points, but obviously, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that we didn't cover. So this is a link to a, a, a nice gear list. And uh, a nice article that's this debate about canoe versus kayak and kind of which trips are better fit for which kind of boat. Okay, uh, so quickly, we'd like to uh, ask you how we did. So we're gonna launch another poll here. Denise, you wanna fire that up? Don't be shy in answering the poll. And be honest. <laughs> yeah, we and got it, a lot it, of great input in the uh, chat boxes. Yeah, I was going to sure. say if uh, if you have any uh, any feedback or suggestions or actually other topics that you'd like us to to hit, throw them in the chat. I'd say I'm going to have Randy Lee carry my beer for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
while we're doing that poll, let me just um, mention that, again, we're going to post uh, this PDF, and we'll also uh, post the video of this. So if you didn't catch everything, uh, you can get it there. I have those out there in a few days. Um, Let's see, in a few minutes, we'll, uh, I know we're a little over time, but we'll open it up. And if anybody wants to hang out and ask some more questions that didn't get answered, uh, we'll be here. And uh, what else? And like we said, any uh, topics or anything that, uh, that you'd like us to address in the future, be interested in, just throw them in the chat. Looks like we're stuck at about 82% on that poll. You want to? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I just am, Jay. Thanks. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, explore, enjoy, protect. That's what CR Club's all about. And uh, we here in the Outings Committee, we are big time into explore and enjoy. So uh, please join us. Uh, you can become a member at that link. Uh, if you like what you see and you'd like to make a donation to CR Club, uh, please do. Uh, you can join our meetup um, at the next link, and that's where we post uh, all of our outings. Uh, and if you'd like to become a volunteer, we got a link for you there. And, you and be a CR, CR Club member to do any of this. I mean, any of the participation part. You do have to to lead and everything, but you do not correct. have to be a member to participate. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, and we, we welcome people who aren't members, not a problem. Uh, but you don't have to be a member to join the group on Meetup. Someone thought you had a, there was a price of $450 or something on the price on the uh, Meetup. So, yeah, I told wow. you it was free. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, but if you are an experienced uh, person in any kind of outdoor activity and you're interested in helping us lead these, um, by all means, we're interested in you. So there's a link for you if you'd like to find out about more about becoming a leader. Okay. And uh, as always, we want to thank our partners uh, in this series, Roads, Rivers, and Trails out of uh, Milford, independently owned uh, outdoor outfitter. Um, Brian's usually here helping us out. It's been a, a great asset and we enjoy partnering with them. And if you need any kind of gear, uh, we highly recommend them. Uh, and then Nancy with Summit Trek and Trail. Um, if you want to be added to Nancy's uh, email list, uh, there's a... Uh... Barry, you just got muted. Not sure what happened, but you're muted. Yep. Thank I don't you. know who muted me. It's probably... Denise probably trying to me. shut me up again. I know, probably. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, go to the next slide. I think we're almost done here anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All oh, right. Sorry, I'm going to stop. Sh I'm, I'm uh, stopping Great. sharing so that I can put the link in the chat box. All Very. right. Great. Okay. And we can go ahead and allow people to unmute here. Uh, so if you do have a question that uh, didn't get answered, feel free to unmute and... Uh, We'll be here. Where or when is your next um, river trip? Well, that's a great question. And uh, the answer is we don't know yet. <laughs> um, Sierra Club is uh, officially shut down from in-person outings of any kind until at least July 4th. So we're actually waiting on uh, basically an update from Sierra Club National to tell us when we can open up. But good news is that we're using this time to actually uh, put together our planning calendar for the second half of the year um, based on the assumption that we're going to open up in July. So I don't have a specific answer for you, but stay tuned. And I'm really hoping that in the next month or two, we'll be posting uh, a lot of a lot of these activities. I don't know. Nancy, would you add anything to that or Jay or really anyone? Well, you know, we knew going into this, that if we give you all this information, that, that we are gonna to have to do something. So we are kind of committed to, as soon as we get it back up running, to run at least a simple trip somewhere around here. Yep. It would be close, you know, it could be on a lake, it could be on a river, something, so that people that are interested uh, can get out there. Uh, and then we'll go, 
And that's yeah. where you need to start anyway. You got to start simple. You, you don't want to start off on the big ones and, unless you've got experience doing things like that. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a great point. The, the one you see posted, you know, this year probably will be um, a, a local trip, you know, a couple of nights, uh, mainly because we want to get more people out kind of learning and enjoying this. So don't expect us to post a, a big trip, uh, you know, one of these national ones this year. That's probably not going to happen. Great question, though. Well, we've all been COVID, uh, what a quarantining and all that good stuff for a year now. So I think everyone's anxious to get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know I'm, we are. <laughs> we're right there with you. <laughs> and actually, we are. We are going out. We just can't take people with us. Yeah, that is true. That is true. We actually, and hopefully you guys are too. You know, hopefully everybody's still getting out. We just, uh, we can't take strangers with us. So. Other questions? Did we did we get any uh, heavy duty questions in the chat uh, that you guys saw that maybe didn't uh, get answered? Barry, it looks like we have quite a few experienced uh, canoeists out there. Good. Or paddlers, Good. both canoe and kayak. So. Uh, Good. Uh, Just want to thank everyone. I'm taking my son out for a, a week trip this summer, so he's excited. Where are you going? Uh, northern Wisconsin, Apostle area. Oh, okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Sounds great. So Barry asks, uh, Emily is asking if our bigger trips are open to non-locals. She's from the Chicago area. Um, I'll let you answer that since you'll probably be the one leading it. <laughs> um, well, they're open to anyone. I mean, it's really a matter of your personal logistics to kind of, kind of get there. And, you know, most of the trips that uh, we do as local outings um, usually aren't long duration ones uh like we were saying earlier our next paddling trip will probably be a local one that's maybe a couple of nights out so whether that's logistically worth it to you or not um i don't know national of course offers trips now they're a little bit different you know they're paid trips and they're um everything provided for you it's more that turnkey kind of trip that we talked about early in the presentation and those obviously they take people routinely from just all over the country um, so if you are, you know, anxious to get out there on a big trip like that, I'd urge you to check out the national uh, program because uh, they have some some wonderful trips there. Um, but if if you're willing logistically to uh, make the trip here, you know, we'll we don't really care where you come from. So Richard is asking what streams or lakes you consider to be local. Jay, well, want to? Little Miami River is uh, you can you can run a, a three or four or five day trip down the Little Miami River in canoe camp. You can't do that on the white water because it's uh, the land is privately owned. Uh, the Green River in uh, Kentucky is a, another one, a very placid river. Uh, camping is a little tight, but you know we, we make the best of it. Uh, the Big South Fork uh, down in uh, the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, but, uh, you know, you got to be real careful on that one because it'll come up in a heartbeat and kill you. Um, you've got the, the Dean Wilderness, the lake at the Dean Wilderness. Uh, you can uh, canoe camp uh, there. Uh, lake Lorimai up, in, uh, uh, up by Dayton is another uh, lake that you can canoe camp from. So these are just, these are all fairly um, small trips and very, fairly close by. Uh, you know, this we have kind of opened up here. There's a group of us. You know, we make a couple of phone calls and we've got a trip. And we've got a half a dozen, eight, ten people ready to go, all experienced people. So when we start opening this thing up to uh, newer people, it, it, it does present kind of a challenge, especially if everybody wants to sign up on the first trip, you know, because you... You have to limit the size of your 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 who you're taking. You, you they're not the campsites aren't that big sometimes. Uh, so you know. Be actually, that, that's actually you raise a good point that I should have included in the planning slide is that some of these uh, places actually restrict the size yes. of the group. In fact, yeah. I would say most of the big trips restrict the size of the group. Yeah. A nice trip Order. for somebody who wants to do something that is um, relatively easy 
as far as the camping option is the Suwannee River Trail in Florida. Oh yeah. They've, yeah. they've got the river camps with the raised platforms and you paddle from camp to camp. They're is this awesome. Swanee like, or the Okie okay, Finoki? Swanee. The Swanee. I didn't know that the Swanee head platforms. It, yes, maybe it's got Google Swanee River Camps. The Swanee okay. River Trail. Google it. Right. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Well, everybody's, well, a few people are still on. Least I, I want to just toss out that um, you all are invited back in two weeks when we're going to do a presentation on the Costa Rican, the wildlife of Costa Rica. So it'll be part on um, the rainforest, the uh, Corcovado National Park rainforest. And uh, the other half will be, we have a marine biologist who lives down there. He's going to be presenting um, on the marine life of the Golfo Luce, which is a really special place in Costa Rica. So that's in two weeks from tonight. Great, glad you uh, remember to do that. That should be a great presentation. Yeah. Okay. There's several people on here who've been there. That's, yeah. Uh, so they can, <laughs> yeah. they'll be able to chime in. Great, yeah. okay. Any other uh, quick comments, thoughts? I know we're a little over time, but uh, all right. Well, great. Well, thank you all. Uh, really uh, appreciate the great turnout, and uh, thank you, hope folks. To see you, see you yeah. out on the trail, or on the water, or on the bike path somewhere in the near Just future. Out. We want to see you out someday. Yeah. And also, if we if we didn't, you know, answer all your questions um, because we are limited on time, please just drop one of us an email. Um, you can even do that through the meetup. Um, or use okay. one of the links. So All thank right. you, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks okay. a lot. Bye-bye.